I'm going to address the virology. My background is virology. I've been working on HIV for since the virus was isolated. And I, I just want to take another dimension of virology and to remind you where we come from in infectious diseases. It's so easy to get uh, involved in the details of contemporary virology, but this is where we come from. You know, the, this, this long battle from Pasteur onwards, Pasteur and Koch, and the true criteria for being on this slide that divided isolated microbes, well, you've made a vaccine, so my apologies to the ladies because there's a slight gender problem. <laughs> but uh, forgive me, so I'll, uh, <coughs> you know, Pasteur started a thing and he made isolated microbes and, and of course made vaccines, right? Max Tyler, yellow fever, Sabian, the oral polio, and Plotkin made the rubella vaccine, where you, which you give the kids with the ROR vaccine. And um, uh, this is where we come from, this long, long battle with microbes. And I, I'm trying to sort of argue that gain of function is, is actually something very special. It's not just another experiment. It's going the other way. And I'll try and point this out. Just very briefly, influenza viruses we characterize them antigenically by the hemagglutinin in H and the N. These are the two proteins on the surface. And the reservoir in the world is actually the aquatic bird population. So if you do a matrix of all the 16 hemagglutinins against all the nine, you find that the ducks are full of them. Okay, so when you go swimming in the next pond in the lake, <laughs> or if the tightest can be, can be in, on the shore, can be as high as a million, be a few for a matter for, just to make you feel good. And shorebirds, and of course mammals, with pigs, uh, and, uh, but this is it. And the question is, uh, where do, uh, or, sorry, I'm going this way. I shouldn't have gone back. Anyway, the question is, will any of these, or which one of these, will then jump and make the next pandemic? And in terms of man, we've, despite this large reservoir, we've only seen this one, this one, and this one. And actually, this one and this one are circulating right now. Okay? Three out of this huge variety of avian viruses. But we do get this thing coming across H5N1, and the question is, could this become uh, the, the, the origin of the next pandemic? So there's a simple experiment, in, because you translate that question into, a, into an experiment, and this is the experiment. It is deliberately, by genetic methods, transforming an avian influenza virus, which is not infectious. If I had H5N1, I couldn't infect you. And then in, through experimentation between mammals, and the preferred mammal is the ferret, so that this virus then becomes transmissible by the airborne route. And as the ferret is the preferred model, and as those three human viruses transmit in this model, the thing is that if I got H5N1 from this through an accident, I couldn't hit you. Sorry to pick you out, but you're the closest <laughs> to me. Okay? And this is a demoniac system. You just infect this animal. You have an airflow. You have two grills here, so they can't spit and scratch and touch each other. And the airflow takes it to the receiver. And if this if one gets ill, then you've got proof of this. And this is it. It's actually making the virus. You're making new viruses. You're increasing the danger level from the human, human point of view. This is totally different to what all those gentlemen and ladies, I mean, I, I come from Pasteur, we have Francois Barry Simpson, and um, uh, what they've been doing, uh, fighting these microbes, we're actually new, producing a new generation of viruses of unknown potential because we will never ever be allowed ethically to inject these into humans and try and find out. Of course, that's ethically inadmissible. So we're left with a lot of angst and the question is, is, that, is the risk associated? Well, this experiment here, this is recently published to 2014. This virus is, uh, was adapted and is transmissible through the aerosol route. What's interesting is that it has a very high fa uh, case fatality rate. 60% of animals die. I don't know if you remember, you don't, uh, we, none of us remember Spanish flu, but Spanish flu, the case fatality rate was 2%. This is 60%. And if we believe that assay as a readout or anything vaguely come up, I'll compromise. I'll let's say 6%. I'll give you one log. 6% is huge. It's three times greater than Spanish. It's out there. And then Kaworoke engineered pan-human virus. 
he, took, he changed the H protein, wiped it out so that it was totally escaped vaccine coverage. Now, as it's the human virus, we know this is transmissible with humans. We don't need to do the experiment. If I got it, you would. I'm sorry. It's the last time I'll do it. <laughs> okay? and, and just even if it was as mild as a, uh, as a seasonal flu, seasonal flu kills this number of people every year. It's mild. That's, and, of course, the range of risks. I don't know if you know, but seasonal flu is still pretty expensive to an economy. And, of course, we have to face seasonal flu every year. But if now we have a man-made virus that's added to it, the virus escapes for some reason, well, you're going to quickly, we could barcode it. You've all done PCR. You know you can do, you'll have the result in 24 hours. And then you're going to go after the lab with insurance claims. And this, of course, is totally new. If I work on Ebola, I mean, it's, it's a natural thing. If I, we don't work on Ebola, then we're neglecting people who are suffering. But this is now a new virus, and this would this cause huge, huge numbers. And I'm just to remind you that universities have endowments, and even Harvard, you know, this, if you had this number of deaths from a lab virus, liability lawyers would, 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 would demolish Harvard. And if they can demolish Harvard, there's no one else who can survive. They will be the last to go. But this is probably the most important part. You'll be undermining public trust in science. What have we been doing for 100 years? Fighting microbes. And now what are we doing? We are making viruses, uh, viruses that don't actually... I, I, I can't go into tonight because I uh, speak too long. They don't think they give us anything good. They don't give us drugs, vaccines, insight into pandemics, prediction of pandemics. So there's very little, and there's the risk aspect in this. There's some other problems which are more sociological here. I am not mentioning the word ethics, of course. But there is the huge ethical dimension. But this, these issues were not flagged up fast. Our sort of internal self-regulated self-governance mechanisms, they were up there. And as Mike said, you know, there was an initial wave of interest in up to 2000, and then it just went quiet. No one consulted risk management. No one, no one consulted lawyers about liability. No one's done a liability analysis. No one's commissioned a risk or a liability analysis. Who the, the funders are funding this and they're not paying attention? Why? Why? No one's drawn up a uh, position paper. One of the best documents you'll find is the Dutch and the German ethic right report. That's about it. Nothing from the UK, nothing, well, we're here, but nothing from the, the US. This, the ethical dimension, we're making risk. Okay, we as the, the benefits they were touting there, but no one's told the public that actually we're exposing them. They could be, if there was a risk, they're now exposed to very, very small risk that if it ever got out, would have catastrophic dimensions because a flu infection is not simply 10 cases. Funders funded, they just went on funding. I don't think that something wasn't ticking. Learned bodies were inaudible, okay? There's the Dutch and there's the German ethic, but that's about it. And the journals were not well equipped, and they didn't handle it properly. And it fell to outsiders to ring the bell and to do the hypothesis breaking, which, of course, when you do hypothesis making, it's incumbent on the scientists to do the hypothesis breaking. And they weren't doing the hypothesis breaking. Conclusions, I think this needs a lot of discussion and thought. I put thought in here, because I'm not sure if, as we go across the library and try and find the the journal with the re a recipe to handle this. I don't think there is a, a, a solution out there. We've got to invent and create a solution. We need a consensus within the infectious disease community because otherwise we're not going to advance. Speaking as a virologist, we don't have the time. You, The younger people you know, you're in a very fiercely competitive environment. You don't, you can't back off. I can because I'm, I'm grey, right? I can take time out, but you can't. You've got to produce your end is, is pressure cooker, and you can't take time off. And I find my virologists just don't have the energy to get their head around it. They would like to say, no, can you handle it? I don't really have time, and I can understand that. So we need outsiders to counter corporate things, and um, I do think we need uh, dirt committees to help funders and give advice. And I'll stop by saying, <clears throat> I'm trying to put together a, a website that's just gone up recently. It's incomplete. I'm trying to have a dispassionate scientific discussion of this 
to try and lift what I call lifting the fog or gain of function, or I think it's lifting. So it's not just a continuation of a normal spectrum of scientific work. It's going in a totally different dimension. And I think we have to address it. It's not just another small blip on the radar. It's something fundamentally different with very, very complex uh, um, parameters involving very, very diverse people. And one of the good things for me that's come out of this, I've, lot learned, I've met a lot of new people with tremendous competence. And there's a lot of people who have thought about this. So we're not in a vacuum. So that's the good news. I'll stop there.